My name is William Mulati. I work at the Missouri Botanical Garden, the Center for Biodiversity Informatics. Uh, me and my colleague, Trish Rosehandler, would like to uh, talk a little about use cases that we had in annotations and the things that we intend to do and see, if, look for uh, partners uh, in, in crime and see uh, any recommendations, tools, whatever that you might have and know, we are we glad to know about them. So the Center for Biodiversity Informatics is uh, part of the Missouri Botanic, uh, the IT division of the Missouri Botanical Garden and seeks to provide uh, innovative technology uh, solutions to uh, live scientists. Uh, we've worked in different databases on specimens like uh, Tropicus, which in, in botany is a, a reference worldwide. Um, <clears throat> databases on, uh, on um, uh, uh, as a library, a uh, digital library, Botanicus, local, and then an international collaboration, BHL, which Martin talked uh, earlier. We also work with the World Flora Online project that uh, tries to compile uh, uh, flora online of all the described species and so on. So why are we here? Well, uh, because of you, the Annotate Conference in 2016, we were looking for information on the projects that we have done and how we can improve them. And it turns out that in 2016, you said that there was needed interoperability, domain use cases, and use center design to uptake the web annotation. So um, one of the projects that we've done uh, almost seven years ago was uh, the uh, Charles Darwin Library was digitized. All, their, all his books were digitized and the scholars analyzed their annotations and put them online. So part of the, what we did was uh, make that available uh, through the BHL. And it, it's interesting because it reflects, it, it attempts to reflect the process of thinking that Charles Darwin was doing as uh, I think Martin illustrated earlier today. So one of the um, examples here, this is, this is how BHL interface looks with uh, the part of the, uh, one of the books that was in the uh, Darwin's library. Um, as you can see, it has pagination, which in a way is a, a form of uh, annotation. Uh, these are images, right? This is not necessarily text. This is images from very old books and a lot of, a lot of them. Um, there's uh, scribbles, as Martin pointed out earlier. In this example, um, it says uh, um, that it was taken from Mr. Bellamin or Salamin, Darwin wrote terribly, by the way. Um, but it's a, there's a page uh, strike there. All that has been analyzed by scholars and put into uh, uh, content that we associated. Um, this allows for, to follow that process of thinking. Um, you'll see here that he's talking about rabbits in this example and how um, some of the ones that have uh, the ears, uh, because it have flops, uh, could have actually a different type of rabbit. And you see how he's thinking about uh, this process of uh, the origin uh, of species. And of course, again, all that has been annotated by scholars. So this is a very scholarly approach to the annotation. Uh, we would like to think that everybody's doing this, but uh, we got a big surprise ahead of us. Um, we did a project actually called Mining Biodiversity um, with, uh, as part of the Digging into Data Challenge. Um, we were partnering with people from uh, Canada and the UK. We, had, we worked with the National Center for Text Mining in Manchester and uh, the Institute for uh, Big Data Analysis from the Housie University and the Social Media Lab from Ryerson University in Canada for a multidisciplinary approach. The idea was to transform BHL uh, to suggest how to transform BHL into a next generation social digital library. So we would do enhancement, OCR correction, um, national, uh, natural language processing and text mining. Uh, we would create uh, terms uh, to do some uh, semantic metadata to support interactive uh, semantic search, uh, more than just the full, uh, full text search that uh, was gonna be implemented. Um, why was this so important? Well, if you, look at, if you ever look at OCR and try to, to work with that, 
it's terrible, especially if it's from old books. So uh, improving that is a major thing, uh, a major difference. It's not like uh, scanning uh, PDFs or the current PDFs that some of the disciplines are doing now. We, um, we also have uh, different names of uh, uh, species uh, that have different connotations, if you may know. And we need to also deal with synonyms, things that are uh, called different in, uh, in uh, different times. So we went and tried to extract uh, species, locations, habitat, anatomical parts, qualities, persons, temporal expressions, all these entity types from uh, the text and the associations that they have. Um, we went through uh, observations, um, habitation, um, nutrition, trade, and so on. The approach was we would take uh, seed documents, annotate them, an annotated creator would annotate them, learn the semantics uh, automatically, try to annotate some on label documents, get the feedback, and store that um, in a database that would allow us then to label others. That was done with a tool that the uh, National Center for Text Mining had, Argo, that would allow us to define workflows. And so that's the interface that we had. We color-coded different types of entities. Um, we would have loved to have the PDF color-coded, but instead we had actually the text. Um, and yes, that text sometimes had very big problems. Um, we got from there a lot of uh, an annotator and uh, searcher use cases, uh, things like uh, marking out an annotation and not deleting it because they want somebody else to come and when they're going to annotate it again, find out that it shouldn't be, that it has been annotated and it has been corrected. Um, so it's not as easy as deleting anything. Uh, deal with homonyms, um, uh, uh, confirm versus still need to review and so on. The searcher wanted to look for combinations, uh, for example, uh, things that feed on something else. So we tried to test those used real cases. And this is the interesting thing. We enhance, uh, we did mock-ups enhancing with faceted search, with uh, time-sensitive search, and, and automatically generated questions. And we went to several of the users, made a survey, and asked them for uh, that functionality. Here, we're looking for a species reported between a couple of years. And we filter those that have annotations in habitat, morphology, and reproduction. Um, as you can see there, the, for the facets. Um, then we also ask them to, uh, uh, having generated uh, questions um, that we created from the terms and the relations that we found. But uh, it turns out that their answers would be, this is very relevant for their work, but uh, I can see how, I cannot see how this can be useful for, but not currently. And there was no strong sentiment on whether this functionality is was something that they would find useful. The same happened to subject, verb, object, uh, things that feed on something. Uh, we created even interfaces to show them uh, the results. It was not some, that they had to, to code strange things. It was always a, a nice UI, but, uh, they could see how the graph-based visualization of results could be useful, but again, not for the current purposes. Um, the same happened with uh, directly associated concepts. The same happened with uh, indirectly associated concepts, um, like uh, looking for a taxa that is associated uh, with others through a geographic location and so on. So we promised the moon and they didn't like it. But we did get some use cases, some interesting use cases, like tagging the original description, host plans, illustrations and plates, uh, treatments, marking errors, orthographic variants, and so on. We also found a, a use case that tried to implement, and, or it did implement, which was uh, an application to query expansion using term, a term inventory. Um, we did uh, something that we call semantically relatedness, so that we could look at those that are similar to something that's being looked upon. And there was an expansion of the query because we could use uh, common names and so on in the query. This is a use case, a real use case that I love, by the way. Um, um, Dr. Sandy Knapp, the specialist in Melastomatasia, was in Q, and she was curating some specimens, and she found this uh, strange, uh, 
name and she didn't know who it was. And people, she tweeted about it and people started trying to say, trying to look for names, places, dates, and so on. Um, finally, it turned out it was, that's a C and a G, believe it or not, and it's someone in northern Rhodesia, not in Zambia, what she thought. Um, the, what I want to point out here is, after all this, the next time that someone looks for it, they're not going to know. There's no annotation anywhere. There's no, yeah, there's a tweet somewhere, but unless we can get that into annotations, uh, then we, you know, we're going to help others. Um, <clears throat> there's another real use case with uh, Archibald Byron McCallum and the 17 ways to write it, according to the OCR text. Um, and this other one is a particular one that I like because it's uh, the um, etymology of the word elephant and the origins of the word uh, tamarind, which is Indian date. It's a footnote in a book talking about the natural history of Ceylon. I found it by, you know, I don't know how I found it. But uh, anyway, if this doesn't get marked somehow, this doesn't get recovered, uh, it's just lost. It's like having nothing. We tried an experiment with this project. We tried a discus uh, for six months. Um, it was, it's a social commenting tool. We did all the analysis, how we're gonna use it. Uh, we pr tried out with the users. You could get uh, people logged in. Um, they could have a community. They could annotate their, their uh, comments. Um, and we got 188 individual annotators, annotations, sorry. Um, the tool had to be discontinued because uh, uh, it was considered a proprietary tool and wouldn't be scalable. But we did get a trial that demonstrated the, a, a very good desire from users to actively engage in annotation process. And it was very interesting, and I told some people here, that it was actually citizen scientists and librarians, the ones who did most of that annotation. And now Trish is gonna talk about uh, what do we intend to do later. So. Okay, so science gossip. Uh, this was a oops, let me go back here. This was a collaboration that we did with a group in the UK that was called Constructing Scientific Communities: Citizen Science in the 19th and 21st Centuries. Um, what were citizen scientists doing in the 19th century, and comparing that to how folks are um, doing citizen science science today? The site was built within the Zooniverse platform. And um, we were looking for the public to help us with annotating illustrations within 19th century periodicals from BHL. And so what we did is we were asking users to tag images within text and even particular regions of images uh, with the information about the, uh, the species that were being represented, the illustrators who made, um, made the images and any inscriptions that they found on them. And here's just an example of um, the bounding boxes they were asked to draw and then recording um, scientific names and inscriptions as well. So Zooniverse tools facilitated collaboration very well. It really allowed for conversations around the annotations and ways to do it better. They had this talk module in, within Zooniverse. And the Science Gossip user group really came together and they collectively decided to um, build vocabularies of illustrator names so that there was consistency across their annotation work. Um, they could also suggest user interface tweaks, which we actually could accommodate fairly quickly because we had the luxury of having a Zooniverse developer on our team uh, who could make those, those changes for us. This, uh, the Science Gossip project is still ongoing. It's just on a smaller scale now. And what was interesting was that the, um, the types of users that were coming and doing this work, these were not the scholars in the botanical um, biodiversity community, but um, these are really citizen scientists and their motivations, it's, it's really just a personal passion and a desire to advance science in general. So based on the work that um, we've done with annotations over the past eight years and the stuff that William talked about with Darwin's library, mining biodiversity and um, with science gossip, um, all of these involve essentially adding annotations to historic biodiversity literature. And um, after we observed firsthand both the, the interest and excitement and engagement from users in the biodiversity community, 
we were able to gather these uh, kind of basic use cases of the types of annotations that folks were adding and what their motivations were. And from this, we decided we really wanted to pursue uh, a more in-depth and structured study of the annotation needs of, a very, of an even more specific group, in this case, the botanical community. And we wanted to, um, we wanted to do this through an IMS planning grant. So why, why botanists? Why the botanical community? Well, it's a community, obviously, we work at a botanical garden. So it's a community that we know very well. And also, uh, this community is somewhat interesting in that they have established uh, standardized reference tools. So the um, International Plant Names Index, which is a database of published plant names and associated bibliographic details for authors, collectors, and publications. And I'll just show you some of these, this more structured data here. It's in IPNI. And they also have a, um, another reference tool called the BPH, which is a worldwide bibliography of periodicals. So in order to write, really write a successful proposal, we, we, we needed to establish a national need for annotation functionality. And so in early uh, 2017, um, we did a landscape review on annotation use within libraries. And we first thing we did was we looked at the latest edition of the New Media Consortium's Horizon Report. This is the, li the library edition, which at that time was their 2015 edition. The 2017 hadn't come out yet. And essentially this report um, identifies emerging technologies that are likely to have the greatest impact on academic and research library in the next one to five years. And while annotations were not explicitly called out in that report, but they were implicit in the report's identification of the semantic web and linked data as key technologies that are going to significantly impact academic and research libraries in the next two to three years. And this really resonated with us. Uh, libraries increasingly um, are beginning to understand that it's just insufficient to provide access to online collections, but users really want these integrated semantic uh, web tools among the library site services. And so annotation, annotating or uh, tagging or making comments about an online resource, um, it, as, as everyone I'm sure in this room knows, it's been an important part of the vision for the semantic web from the beginning. So we also looked at how widely was it being adopted. And what we found is unlike publishing in the journalistic communities, there was really uh, little to no uptake within libraries, particularly in the US. And so at that time when we were doing this landscape review, we could only identify two examples, both outside the US. The National Library of Australia's Trove Repository had some annotation functionality. And then we found the Europeana Sounds Project so we wondered, you know, was this due to a lack of availability of annotation tools? But then, in fact, when we started looking into what were, the, what were all the different tools that were out there, we found at least there were four that were open source hypothesis, obviously. Uh, Rerum, Annotorius, and Digilib were just four that we identified. So around the same time as we were doing the review, we were contacted by the developers of Rerum. Uh, they are based at the Center for Digital Humanities at St. Louis University, same city we were in. And Rerum is essentially an open store annotation, um, open annotation store tool that was developed for describing medieval manuscripts. And the developers were interested in testing the tool beyond the humanities. So they wanted to see how adaptable it was to other domains, which sounded, um, so they had an interest and we had an interest in working with them. So together we, uh, we wrote this proposal. We received the grant this spring. And the full title is Consumers as Creators, Understanding the Annotation Needs of the Scientific Community Through the Domain of Botany. Uh, we also are using the hashtags Consumers as Creators or Botanitate, it's the other thing we like to call it. The funder was the Institute of Museum and Library Services. It began on May 1st, so this is all very new for us, and it's going to run for one year till April, end of April in 2019. And again, the partners are uh, Center for Biodiversity Informatics, the uh, Peter Raven Library, also at MOBOT, and then the Center for Digital Humanities at St. Louis University. So the purpose of the grant is essentially um, to, analyze web, uh, to analyze web annotation needs of the botanical community, develop a prototype of how those needs can be met within a digital library platform. 
We're going to look at the practicality of using existing annotation tools to satisfy the community's needs. We're going to look at the technical, the economic, and operational considerations. And then we're going to try and come up with a set of best practices to um, integrate a tool within a virtual library. The results will help illuminate and inform about the annotation needs within botany, but also uh, we think this will be relevant to the broader scientific research community. We think there'll be about three audiences that could benefit from this project. So librarians who are looking to improve their virtual libraries by enabling their users to add value to their content. Botanists who want to enhance the corpus of their digital library collection by augmenting knowledge through um, the annotations provided. And then, of course, software developers, many of which are here, who want to either develop or adapt a tool to enable annotations in their online solutions, particularly when within a digital library platform. So we have uh, four deliverables. We have a needs analysis report. There's a feasibility study, a proof of concept prototype, and an outcomes assessment. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on these. So needs analysis report, we're going to be using a case research re approach to this. We're going to interview at least 10 users of botanical virtual libraries from five separate institutions. And then we're going to be analyzing answers and classifying them by um, user type, purpose, and function. And then the uh, feasibility study, we're going to be looking at uh, the four open source annotation tools that I mentioned, um, looking at evaluating them in order to understand how well they could satisfy, satisfy this community's needs in their current state without any particular um, additional development. And we've done, we've done some preliminary assessments of these tools, but we're going to look more in depth at things like hardware and software requirements, uh, functionality available for creating user roles, trying to understand kind of what the um, staff time will be needed for installing and setting up the tools, and just sort of what the overall learning curve is, which we think will be useful to libraries who have, might have limited technical support. And then we're going to do this proof of concept prototype. Uh, we're going to a uh, RARAM is going to be integrated within a digital library platform called Botanicus. Botanicus is a tool that uh, that CBI developed, we developed in-house. It serves as basically a portal to our historic literature from the mobile library. And we're going to be testing the integration effectiveness of the requirements compliance. So basically by performing an actual installation of a prototype of one of the tools within a digital library platform, we th we're, we're going to be able to corroborate our estimations to determine how to cope with any kind of new issues or risks that had not been foreseen. And then the fourth and final deliverable is an outcome assessment, and there we'll identify kind of what the requisites are, the best practices, the needed task, and further developments required. And also, we want to be able to, um, within the end of the year, identify what are uh, appropriate partners needed for a full-scale project plan. And then um, trying to figure out what are the activities that we need for expanding and scaling this prototype, essentially. So, um, so our, again, our intention for the planning grant um, from the beginning was always to just kind of lay this foundation for a follow-on research grant. So we are looking for partners who are interested in developing use cases for specific domains, um, particularly the larger scientific community. So we were really excited to get to come here. This is our first um, iAnnotate conference. And so to be able to come here and talk with folks who really understand um, annotations from a lot of different perspectives, seeing how our experiences fit in with a larger conversation about annotation work and we just really appreciate the opportunity to come and present to you. So please come talk to us if you are interested in collaborating, or maybe you just know of other groups who might parallel some of what of our interests are, and, um, or if you even have tools that you think would work for this particular community, please let us know, and that's our contact information up there. That's it. Thanks.